Greetings, members, one and all of the Salivation Nation. There are many lessons that we can learn from gold. And in this video, we're going to be talking about one of the most important lessons. So let's explore. What is your standard of living? Many people feel with technology and uh, advances in science and medicine that we are living in the best standard of, of living ever. But there's a lot of areas in life that the quality is not quite there. Uh, there are certain downsides to technology and there is also just as much misinformation nowadays as it ever was before in terms of science and medicine. We've learned, especially through the medium of the, of the internet and mass information um, stuff coming in from all different angles that it's really difficult to really know who or what information to trust. But regardless, there are some fundamental truths out there. And those are things that surpass um, all of the technology and all of the noise that seems to surround us today. And it has been seen in certain studies that the standard of living and the lifespans have gone down by certain measures in some of these larger cities around the country and around the world as well. There's a lot of problems these days. I think one could make a cogent argument that the standard of living has fallen, especially in the last five years here. Uh, you know, many of us, when we were kids, we were thinking, okay, things are only going to get better from here. Our kids and the kids that come after and the generations will have it much easier than we did. You ever heard the story about walking uphill both ways and get to school? How hard it was when you were a kid or your parents ever told you that? Well, there's something to be said for something of that, but there's also a golden age of reason and a golden age of gold in general. And I believe and I'm going to have an article here that kind of backs me up on this, as shared with me by a member of the community, that the gold standard of living was a good gauge, something to uh, look to, uh, because it is about a standard of living. And that standard of living could be tied to the gold standard. So check this out. On October the 15th, 1971, Richard Nixon announced that the U.S. dollar would no longer be redeemable in gold. But it didn't start there. It began even before. All he did was just close the window that was already uh, most of the way shut. It was supposed to be temporary, but yet 51 years later, here we are. The gold standard was gradually destroyed in the 20th century. Now people are experiencing the consequences, less purchasing power, more economic cycles, and a weaker economy. Now, again, it's a, very, it's a very generalized statement, and it does, uh, we must recognize and understand that periods of inflation and uh, less purchasing power did occur to some extent uh, when there was a gold standard, but mainly because people kind of abandoned or went above and beyond what the gold standard was supposed to do. Um, and in this article here on gold-eagle.com by Andre Marquis, it talks about and makes some pretty good arguments here. We're going to look back a little bit into history, though, first. The classical gold standard was from 1815 to 1914 and intended to prevent the government from running budget deficits and going into debt as it could not easily create inflation. It doesn't say that it didn't happen. It did, but it made it more difficult. It, it was a rules-based monetary system. In 1913, the Federal Reserve was born in December of that year when the U.S. entered the First World War, also known as the Great War. U.S. dollars were printed at an excess of the gold reserves. At this point, the U.S. got off the classical gold standard and this money printing contributed to the Depression of 1920 and 21. A lot of people didn't talk about that. The reason it didn't get so bad is because of the actions of Calvin Coolidge, one of the great presidents that a lot, not a lot of people know about. And he implemented 
uh, policies that got the government out of the way and relied on the uh, free enterprise system to get us out of the depression, and it worked. But then we saw something called the gold exchange standard that ran from 1926 to 1931. Um, and the US dollar and the pound sterling were the two currencies of reference. They were the key currencies. The US went back to the classical gold standard, converting the US dollar into gold. The pound sterling and other currencies were not convertible into gold, except for large bars. The Great Britain converted the pound sterling to US dollars and other European countries converted their currency to the pound sterling. So the Great Britain inflated uh, their pound sterling and other European countries did the same with their respective currencies, sort of a pyramiding of the Great Britain pound and the dollar and of other European currencies on the pound standard. And then we had the fluctuating fiat currencies that ran from 1931 to 1945. In 1933 and 34, the U.S. abandoned the classical gold standard once again. The U.S. dollar was defined as one thirty-fifths of an ounce of gold, and only foreign governments and central banks could convert it into gold. So there was a certain link to gold, but the U.S. was in a floating exchange rate regime. Um, and this Rothbaum stated by cutting the ties of gold, uh, this regime leave the absence of a control of each national currency in the hands of its government, which can allow its currency to fluctuate freely with respect to all other fiat currencies. The flaw is to hand total control of the money supply to the government and then to expect that it will refrain from using that power. But we know how that's turning out, especially as we see today what's going on. The disastrous experience of the 30s, a world of fiat paper and economic warfare led to the United States authorities to aim the restoration of a viable international monetary order. And we know what happened in 1933 and in 1934. That was the confiscation of gold. Now again, understanding that they didn't actually go door to door to take your gold, but they penalized owning a certain amount above what they deemed to be acceptable for each individual. Then we had the Bretton Woods system and the new gold exchange standard from 1945 to 1968. And uh, that was the uh, system which was in New Hampshire in 1944 and ratified by the U.S. Congress in 1945. It was similar, similar to, the new, to the gold exchange standard, but with the U.S. dollar being the only key currency priced at $35 an ounce of gold and being redeemable in gold only by foreign governments and central banks. However, this system eventually met its end. Uh, the U.S. inflated the dollar, and other governments held U.S. dollars as their reserves and essentially pyramided their currencies on those dollars. And what does that remind you of when they say the word pyramid? There's a scheme named after it. And throughout the 60s, the U.S. constantly inflated the dollar in absolute terms and relative to Europe and Japan. And this decade was marked by the War on Poverty and the Vietnam War and space programs. Massive spending, especially with the Great Society um, that we saw under Lyndon Baines Johnson. To finance all of this, the U.S. started running large budget, budget deficits with the Fed monetizing the debt, expanding the money supply. However, the Western European countries that had adopted more solid monetary policies, like in Western Germany, Switzerland, France, and Italy, started to oppose the obligation to accumulate dollars. Europe began to redeem dollars in gold, and the Bretton Woods system began to collapse in 1968, and essentially met its death nail in 1971, when Nixon suspended the redemption of the U.S. dollar in gold. That suspension is looking to be pretty permanent by now. And I want to harken back also to what happened in the 60s. Many people remember what happened in the 60s when uh, Linda Baines Johnson took us completely off the silver standard as well. That's right. In 1964 was the last, well, 1965 was technically the last year that silver coins were produced. All silver coins produced in 1965 uh, were dated 1964. And that was it. That was it. So we had no precious metals backing 
only clad in paper at that point. And right now, look where we are at right now. Uh, even regular uh, clad coinage that you see out there um, is almost, you know, losing. There's almost less value. There's uh, more metal in some of these coins than there are than the, than the face value. This is not an example. I'm trying to find another example here of a coin that uh, where that is the case. And typically it would be the Lincoln cent or something similar to. Here we go. Here's a, a real kind of a, a dinged up Lincoln cent. Even this with, a, with a, the copper and the zinc is worth more than one cent these days. Uh, the nickel is another example where we have essentially uh, now have coins that um, uh, in circulation right now that are worth more and then the face value that is stamped on those coins. Here's a nickel, so you can see that this is worth more than a nickel these days. Uh, crazy to think about, but that's that's where we are at. And so people are saving their pre-82 Lincoln cents, and people are also saving their nickels. Uh, but uh, there it is. So uh, that is just it. So uh, that's what happened in 1971. The closing of the gold window and the rise of the floating exchange rate system. In order to keep the redemption of the U.S. dollar in gold, the U.S. government had two options. Cut spending and taxes to reduce the budget deficit. The supply of money would decrease and the U.S. dollar would appreciate, which would allow prices to fall to levels that would be consistent with an ounce of gold at $35 an ounce and restore demand for the currency or two, dollar devaluation. This would mean the price of an ounce of gold would have to rise to a level that would be consistent with the supply of dollars and the higher prices for goods and services. But this would require the government to reduce the budget deficit and prevent future devaluations. Both options were inconvenient for the government, that's for sure. Thus, in February 1973, after two devaluations of the U.S. dollar that raised the price of an ounce of gold to $42.22, which, by the way, is still on their ledgers um, in Fort Knox and in other places, the closing of the gold window became permanent. Therefore, the U.S. dollar returned to the floating exchange rate system as in 1931 to 1945, but now with no link to gold. And what else happened in 1973 that saved the dollar? Well, we can thank uh, Henry Kissinger for that. The U.S. dollar devalued in the, the 1970s were marked by stagflation. In 1980, the price of an ounce of gold was $850 an ounce. The price of oil rose from just under $3 a barrel in 1970 to just under $40 a barrel in 1980. The consumer price index was over 14% in 1980. It was only in the early 80s that the CPI began to decline when Paul Volcker Fed Chairman at the time raised the federal funds rate to almost 20%. But what the article doesn't touch on right here is what I uh, just alluded to earlier, but what Henry Kissinger did in 1973. He basically tied the dollar to gold or to oil. Oil, which is why we even have till even now today, what is known as the petrodollar. Although the petrodollar is becoming less and less viable these days, uh, but nonetheless, that is the case, the petrodollar. Um, in 1980, the federal debt was only $930.2 billion, still a lot even by today's measure, but look where it is now. Thus, it was possible to significantly increase interest rates without causing major impacts on the economy. Today, the federal debt is above $30.5 bucks. <laughs> wow. Think about that for a moment. Let that sink in. I don't think really anybody can let that sink in. It's just out of the realm of, 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 of understanding that much debt. The Fed can't raise rates without crashing the economy. The U.S. has gone from being the world's biggest creditor in the 70s to the world's biggest debtor today. Um, and now, as the federal funds rate rose, the U.S. dollar appreciated, and there was a restoration of confidence in the currency. Uh, this, along with the fact that the U.S. dollars are already the currency in which oil and other commodities were priced, allowed the U.S. dollar to remain the main world reserve currency. And this, along with the fact that the U.S. dollar has been unbacked since 1971, has allowed the U.S. to inflate it over time, destroying its value. 
As of August the 3rd of this year, an ounce of gold cost $1,765 an ounce at that particular point in time. And so uh, really what does this have to do? Now we've got inflation and what happens with inflation typically is uh, the everything goes up except for your wages. Even if you get a larger than usual percent increase in your wage, uh, it's not gonna keep up with inflation. And that's been the case we've been seeing now. Uh, it's not keeping up with inflation, which means your standard of living is going down in terms of uh, your purchasing power. And this is why we have gold and silver. But these are metals that we should not live off of. These are metals that we should live by. In other words, they are in our possession as a tool of savings of last resort. Um, and this is how we preserve our purchasing power over the course of a long period of time. And gold especially is seen as a more stable uh, wealth preserving device. And uh, it has been evidenced even in the last five years. Look where the price was five years ago. Look where it is now. I remember on this very channel talking about gold and how it has gone over $1,600 an ounce. We were flabbergasted by that when it occurred, um, when we saw move over. And now, you know, the people, the, the most pessimistic among us think that we may see it go back to that at some point in time, but most don't think that's gonna happen. But there you have it. So the devaluation of the US dollar substantially reduced Americans' real wages. Before 1970, usually only one member of a family was able to support it. From the 70s onward, this began to change to the point where today, this is only possible for the wealthiest people. Despite all the technological advancements, the standard of living today is lower than that of the 1950s and 60s, as today, in order to live and to buy things they want or need, people need to work a lot more and even go into debt. As I mentioned before in prior videos, there's so many more people now that have two jobs, that are two or three service-oriented jobs that are doing side hustles and the like, uh, myself included, by the way. And uh, that is the name of the game these days. Uh, families, both uh, mother and father or husband and wife are working. And that is the name of the game these days. In fact, I don't know of but just a handful of people that where there's only a one income earner in the family. And even so, if the man or woman stays home, well, they are doing something on the side to earn a little bit of money. Um, it's just the name of the game. It's what's happening. Uh, if the U.S. dollar had not been devalued since 1913, or even if it had been appreciated, which is what tends to occur when there's no monetary expansion, the standard of living would be much higher today. Yes, indeed. And this is uh, a, a very well done article and uh, amazing indeed. And let me know what your thoughts are about the gold standard of living, this lesson in gold here. I hope you enjoyed this video. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I'd like to extend a multitude of gratitude to you all for taking the time to watch and to encourage you to please rate, share, comment, and subscribe.